that. So you've been writing a long time. Uh, when did you start? In 1973, I wrote a little piece called Bhakti, which was about the innocence, childhood innocence. It was about my own son, Christian. Um, and it was just, I wanted to convey that sense of innocence. And I think I did, it was an instrumental piece, but the first piece I wrote. Okay. And um, how did that beautiful song, This Present Moment, come about? I love that song. It was really based on sitting in my lounge room when I lived in Canterbury, looking out the window at a sunset and thinking, oh my God, how beautiful is this? Just the joy of sitting on your own couch, looking out the window with a fabulous view and seeing that transition you know, from daylight to night time. And uh, it was also based on the idea of the beauty of learning to be still, which is, wasn't my thing then at all. I was very sort of hyperactive. I've learned a little to be still <laughs> since then. <laughs> okay. Now, I know you've moved back to Melbourne in oh, Christmas Eve, I think it was, 2009. 2009, Christmas Eve, yeah. yeah. Moved so, back so, to Melbourne. Okay. And, and how has your work changed in Melbourne, how is it? I think it's become a bit more mellow. I've concentrated a lot more on working rather than with uh, chamber orchestras and with a band. I've done a lot of things, I still do that, but I've done a lot of things with just this a beautiful sounding uh, mahogany Martin guitar. And just the sound of that, it's a wonderful sound. And so I've been doing quite a lot of recording, and I think it's important to record works and record them well in different versions of things. So it sort of mellowed the writing and, and focused me a lot more on the sense of poetry with guitar. Well, yeah, that reminds me of a couple of videos I've seen on YouTube that you've playing, been playing with the cellist, Davy Sapir. Ah, yeah, yeah. What yeah. was that like? To oh, it was brilliant. It was brilliant because it sort of grew out of this real wanting to have this beautiful rich sound i've always been interested in the sounds of strings and like the string quartet and string orchestras so working with ad who's a wonderful cellist was the combination almost like something from renaissance music where you have this beautiful like a beautiful sounding lute with a viola de gambas in, in this case we had an acoustic guitar and a cello and um, particularly for Cellos are great for long notes, beautiful, rich, long notes against faster strumming on the guitar, against the voice. So this present moment certainly became mm. the song that epitomises that. That one's on uh, YouTube with some of the other ones as well. Mm. Mm. Okay. Now before you started writing songs, you, you were composing contemporary classical music. And, and what was it like to make that transition? Yes, people ask me this question. I think it's there's a sense of like they are two totally different genres. And I think in the marketing world, they are two different genres. Like back in the days where you'd go into a record shop, you know, there'd be classical music would be over in the corner and popular music would be near the front, something like that. In my head, and I think a lot of composers and creative artists' heads, we don't work like that. We think in terms of the similarities between these things. So the a piece, say like a ballet score I wrote, Bold New Buildings, had a beautiful um, cello keyboard part in it. I was used that as the uh, piano part for Between Train Stations, that one of the first songs I wrote and put on my first um, songs album. So it was really like taking a cello part from a small chamber orchestra piece, then applying my voice to it. So it was really just grew out of that, really just adding uh, text to things I'd already been um, writing. So for me, it wasn't a tricky um, you know, transition. Oh, and, and what was the inspiration for that song, Between Train Stations? Ah, that was when I was living in London, I think in about 1990 or was it 86? I can't remember. So I was on a train between um, 
from London on the Paddington line. And I ironically met uh, this friend of mine, this lady friend who I hadn't seen for years and years and years, and I'd heard all kinds of things about her. So between Earls Court and Paddington Station, we managed to fill each other in on pretty much what we'd done in the last 20 years of our lives. And I was amazed at this. I ended up giving her a book called Pauper's Paris because she was going to Paris soon and I'd just come back from Paris and I was going back to Australia the next day. So it was just that beautiful feeling of seeing a friend you hadn't seen for 20 years, filling them in on your life and vice versa. The, the thing that got me about it was, and I'm obsessed with titles, and it was originally the opening line is sometimes at night, sometimes through the day, I think of you and wonder how you are. Years have passed since you went your way. Did you live in Paris? Read Rambo in a cafe. And the thing was to me that title sometimes at night wasn't the right title. So as the pressure built up for the recording, the night before we went into Studio 301 in Sydney, great studio with a great sound, was I looked at the last line and the last line is maybe one day I'll see you again between train stations in London and I went aha that's it between train stations is the right time for it. Mm, interesting how these things evolve. Yeah yeah, yeah. It's, it's something to do with staying with the process much longer than you want to. Sometimes something comes very quickly like there's a song of mine, Dark Ships of Sailing In, which I love, which is a flamenco-ish piece. And that took, um, really, I was alone in my apartment for like the whole day and I wrote that in one day. That's the only piece I've ever been able to write in one day. Normally this process is just staying in the process much longer than you know a lot of people I think would. Uh, it's like the idea that Leonard Cohen talked about Hallelujah, taking him five years yeah. to write and Bob Dylan talking about writing songs in the back of cabs and Bob Dylan can probably do that. And it's really interesting. They're both brilliant songwriters and two different ways of working. And do you use all your own words? Or have, you, have you used other people's lyrics? Mainly I use all my own words and um, I love doing that, but also I love poetry and love other people's poetry. So. Uh, a few years ago I went to Wales and uh, stayed in Swansea and in Larn, which was this beautiful village in South Wales where Dylan Thomas lived for the last around about five years of his life in the, uh, the boathouse and I recorded. When I was there it was great, I was welcomed because I have a sort of a Welsh background and I ended up taking um, a poem that he'd written which was he written on a table napkin in America, I think, called um, Old Man or Young Man. So it's a bit like an older man looking back on his younger life. So that's um, turned into the song of mine called Old Man, Young Man. I changed it a bit to accommodate my um, uh, way of phrasing. And I've done that too. I think I've set three of Dylan Thomas's poems to uh, guitar accompaniment. And, um, but primarily I use my own. I have done a couple of other things as well. Ah, I used a poem by Rumi for a song called Grace as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm open to other things. Ah, Job's Tears, there's a bit of Job from the Bible in that, in Job's Tears. I used an incident from my own life and referenced it to the famous uh, Job chapter in the, the mm -hmm. Torah in the mm -hmm. old part of the Bible. Okay. And what are you working on now? Uh, I'm driving myself slowly crazy by writing this <laughs> book of autobiographical stories. Um, I can see now why a lot of composers and artists don't write memoirs. It's um, like I think Lou Reed said that if he wanted to, why he didn't write a autobiography, he said just listen to my songs. And with Lou, you can see that, you know, there's a lot of the work has, um, is autobiographical. In, in my case, I, there's elements of that, but I wanted to talk in detail, particularly the notion a lot of my biggest successes have been in Europe and America, and some of those works have never been performed in Australia. So um, I wanted to address that and 
maybe it correct some you know things that are don't seem to be sort of accurate so certainly writing it is great I'm glad I'm doing it I think maybe I'm halfway through it I thought I could finish it you know in a year and it's going to take longer I'm happy with what's happening and I'm getting support and help around doing that when I'm full of energy and I'm really excited about it it's great and I'm really happy it's just um, it's spring now and I'm sort of wanting to perform and make music but I'm um, writing this book. Oh, thank you very much Robert. Uh, I, uh, I know there are some of your songs are on YouTube. Where, mm. where can people hear your music and your songs? I, at, at present I'm not, I'm not doing much in the way of live performing because of the book. There's probably about 16 songs on YouTube. There's also the film Ballad of Changing Man, the Zev Howley film. Uh, that's and, and there's some other bits and pieces also. Ah, oh, some from from some of the poetry reading things I've done. There's bits. Oh, there's also the launch of Time Being Time, which we did at Collected Works Bookshop in Melbourne, is also on um, uh, YouTube. Oh, great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.